This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 100 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today, it's a milestone. We have a, a lady all the way from Montana, and then Monty gets to sit down with her. And we have another gentleman from Klamath Falls, Oregon. So listen in. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Coach Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. How's everything going your way with horses and peoples and everything in your life? We, we have settled it down into the uh, the autumn routine around here. We've changed the clocks. It gets dark early. Yeah. The daily yeah. rains have stopped. So we've settled into autumn nicely here. Yeah, everybody's starting to talk about coming to your house now in Florida, I think. <laughs> this is the time of year. <laughs> Couldn't get, get them there in yeah. July. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, I'm glad to hear it. It's always kind of nice to have a little routine. Even in Florida, you have seasons. That's we adorable. Do. We have seasons. None of them include snow. <laughs> right. But we definitely. Or falling leaves much, I yes. don't think. Huh? Yeah. Now, do, you, do you also find that friends and family visit more often in winter in California? Yeah, we're pretty much the same here all the time. It depends on where you're coming from. I suppose it's all relative. See, yeah, we, ha we have lots of friends and families from up north. Therefore, visiting happens in the winter. <laughs> oh, here come the snowbirds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we have. It's it's like a pilgrimage here. People come from all over the world all the time. I mean, last week was really fun. We had this lady that um, had come for a course a few years ago, and she was in. Uh, she's from England, and it's starting to get cold there. And she's a Pilates instructor, and she said, I'm on a plane to go to Flagstaff Farms and go teach a Pilates course somewhere in California. I don't care where. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it was pretty cute. And they were soaking up the sun. She brought a friend, too, of hers, a, a female friend. So they were just, like, soaking up the sun, getting sunburned. You know, they were in Palm Springs. They were in Southern California. And um, and she did a Pilates stretching and core exercise double lesson for us for our Equus Online University. Hey, it's gonna Rider be Fitness. So there you go. Rider Fitness. And she's she's great because she is a writer. And she she's kind of on a mission to help people who are, you know, little less than core up there <laughs> and yeah. she wants to help the horses really is what she's she's trying to do is get people just to you know go through a little core exercises some core stretching and things so you I think you'll like it it's really fun it's going to be a nice addition to our That's our great. Equus Online University well every, people need to realize it's not just the horse mm -hmm. doing well it shouldn't be just the horse doing all the work we are really really doing our horses a disservice if we do not maintain a reasonable level of fitness. That's right. Um, and fitness, like you said, from the core point of view, in that you can stay centered and balanced on the animal so that you're not sitting up there like, and, and causing him to constantly lose his balance and having to compensate. So that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Flopping you back up on top of him. Yeah. Um, so, so it is November. It's a no stirrup November too, by the way. Do you do that? Do you do the no stirrup November? I do my best. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good answer. actually. Yeah. I do. I try to participate as best I can. I am prone to dropping my stirrups for uh, yeah, five or 10 minutes each time I ride anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I'm by That's nature a very crooked rider, and I found that that helps me be a little bit straighter if I drop mm -hmm. my stirrups and ride that way pretty much every time I get on. But I have to be careful because I trail ride and hack about a lot, and mm -hmm. uh, we we have occasional um, disruptions in our directional <laughs> flow. So uh, you know, you never know. You never know when there's going to be a squirrel jump out of that newspaper mailbox and yeah. cause a spook. <laughs> Squirrel. Yes. Squirrel. Yeah. Spooky horses. Spooky That's a good horses. topic. Yes. That That's is an interesting a good topic. topic. Yeah, we just did one uh, an Equus Online University uh, dad on tour with Martin Clune. Some people will know him as Doc Martin. Um, funny, funny guy. Horses. Oh, isn't he? Oh, and his yeah, his little itty bitty draft horses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Martin's a big guy anyway. If you've ever seen Martin, if you've seen him in proportion to anybody normal standing next to him, he's a big, 
he's a big guy and he's an actor, uh, but he does own these big draft horses in proportion to himself. He's not a heavy guy either. He's a big, tall guy. And uh, he loves his drafts and they're just, they love him too. But he does have this, we just put a lesson up with his horse named Ronnie. He's had Bruce up on the Equus Online University before too. I think Bruce got started, his first saddle and rider possibly was one of the lessons up there. But dad did start Bruce and Ronnie actually. Um, to saddle. And um, Ronnie is being trained up to be ridden for a horse of the year show, or is it Olympia? I can't remember a big one over in England by Carl Hester. He's going to be really? ridden by Carl Hester Yay! in dressage, <laughs> in dressage, this big Ronnie. And he's just adorable. People have to go and see that lesson, but he's spooky. So they joke in the, in the, I don't want to give it all away, but they do joke in there that they had possibly flying draft horses <laughs> <laughs> for Carl Hester to ride. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so this was a desensitizing, uh, a lesson really for Ronnie or just try to get him over uh, crowd noises, you know, applause and things like that. So people, people want to check that out. So um, did you get to see it? Have you seen it? I watched some of the videos online um, Good. and once I got past the cute factor, <laughs> yeah, <isn't he? laughs> um, that's, that's what keyed me in. That's what got me started. That was my entry level right there. Like, oh, you got to watch this. Oh, this is educational too. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> I learned I, something. I thought it was interesting because it's an efficient and effective and um, humane way to deal with a horse that has a propensity for being spooky. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it might not necessarily be the only way. I've seen lots of people who have, you know, you spooky horse and, you know, you paddle his butt and make him go past it and all kinds of different things that you can do. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this whole desensitizing a horse that's literally spooky versus a horse. He's never had a saddle on. You need to desensitize him to tack versus a horse who he is terrified of mailboxes. Mm, you know, okay. that, that to me is a spooky horse or a horse that um, when he hears, um, animals going through the underbrush, he freaks out. That's a spooky mm -hmm. horse. So mm -hmm. kind of take me through that process of good ways versus not so good ways to deal with that. Oh, okay. Well, it, I'll do a quick answer for that one. It basically, we'll start with your first premise that a first saddle bridle and rider, you know, and a, and a horse who just is not acclimated to that yet. They haven't been started. Um, and, and we, I do, I do set out to change the world from the breaking term. I, I, I just think, you know, that's pervasive and people, if they start, you know, their back teeth start to vibrate when they say it, it I'll be happy. <laughs> Stop <laughs> saying breaking. So starting is the word we use. And, and I think the, probably the most important word to use when you're starting a horse is incremental. So getting a horse used to something is just a matter of being slow and patient and incremental and reading your horse. And so first saddle, bride, I know that dad is sort of famous for, for 30 minutes or less mm -hmm. this, you know, and, and some people think that's all he's famous for actually <laughs> is starting a horse, which is kind of crazy. Cause he's, you know, he won multiple double digit world championships in all kinds of disciplines. So he, he really does know the top of the horse too, but I think he's most famous for getting a horse's, first saddle bridle and rider up in 30 minutes or less. And now people go, wow, is that some like trick or something? And it's not, it's understanding your horse and, uh, and getting him to, um, trust. I mean, join up is about trust. And that's that exercise where you communicate with him that you're not out to get him and horses being survivalists, you know, they're hyper vigilant and, and prey animals being survivalists. If you do anything that affirms the fact that you are a predator, <laughs> then like hitting him, chasing him, or, you know, doing something overtly, um, creating fear as opposed to moving the feet. So mm, what does that look like? Maybe, Maybe you need to do with some studying because there is a difference between controlling the feet, asking a horse to go away, asking a horse to come in and allowing that horse to build a relationship and a bond with you. And then to put the saddle and bridle and rider up, those are incremental steps where you're not, uh, you, you, 
every step you're assuring him that it's not going to hurt them, but they get to express whatever they need to express because some horses are more sensitive than other horses. And there are going to be other horses. Maybe um, there are other draft horses than Ronnie that are a little, you know, more cold cold blooded <laughs> and they just you know they'll be calm ronnie wasn't one of them for a draft horse he was very sensitive which probably is is why he's going to be a good dressage horse ultimately he learned really fast he's really intelligent so but now let's take a spooky horse like ronnie who um the crowd noises so people would applause he went like he wants to jump in your lap and the guy's like 17 hands right he's <laughs> that could end poorly for someone yeah. Someone. Yes. Yeah. Not Ronnie, probably Ronnie somebody who is in. The <laughs> and so you want to get a horse that's um, super sensitive to whatever it is. Some horses are more sensitive to noise. Right. I mean, we know the ears, the the um, whatever it is. Sight is a big one for horses. Why does a plastic little tiny, you know, plastic bag that weighs like one ounce in a tree look like a killer? You know why? That's a visual thing. So horses visual, horses auditory, whatever their sensitivity is. Now you really have to prove that that's not going to kill them. So in Ronnie's case, the audience noise was was really over the top for him. And that's an incremental in itself. I mean, dad suggests that he uses the audience actually to do a little clapping at first and and then show Ronnie that he's not going to die when they clap and then do it. Again. And then the the pattern or that formula to take home is keep doing these noisy things at home, put a boom box or whatever you want to call it these days that produces loud noise. There's an noise. app for that. I guarantee it. There's oh, a noise yeah, that, app. I think I've heard that. <laughs> I think I've heard that. True. And you just put it on a loop or I don't know how you yeah. do that too, but you know, just and and plan trips that where you can expose them to noises that are different in different ways. At nighttime might be different than daytime because that's a combination of, of both the visual and the auditory. You know, and, and so read your horse and and do what you can to incrementally get them over it. But don't feed into the predator part. Don't buy into that you're a predator. So you must make them and you are going to flood them with, um, overwhelm them. You know, a lot of people use that yeah. term flooding, yeah. oh, you know, and overwhelm it, describes it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's overwhelming. And that's just, then they just shut down. Okay. And, let me, let me stop there because I think that's a very, very important detail mm -hmm. because yeah. it is easy to lose sight because especially when you're training and you have an end goal, I need mm -hmm. to have this horse despooked by the time championships rolls around. Right. Right. <laughs> so incrementally, yeah. you are exposing the horse in very small, palatable doses to what he perceives as spooky, but you are doing it in a planned fashion. So the horse yes. never genuinely becomes fearful. He never actually runs away and crashes into the round pen wall. Right. Clear concern. Well, they might. I mean, you know, the, it, it won't be your fault. If, if you're doing too much, you know, back it off. So you have to judge your horse, but clear, concise, and fair. I mean, be clear, concise and fair. In, okay. Yeah. Be incremental with everything you do and then clear, concise, and fair. Black and white all the time and then ratchet it slowly up. Come back if the horse is not handling it. But, but this, um, to think that you can, well, it's like aversion therapy. Some people will know um, in the addiction world, there's things called aversion therapy. And that is like trying to overwhelm something with the negative of whatever it is they're trying to not become addicted anymore to, you know, okay. and aversion therapy n never worked in the people world really. And now all that's changing in the last couple of decades. Well, it's the same thing for horses. I don't believe in flooding, but a lot of people will, you got to figure out what they're defining flooding as. Some people just think that's desensitizing and desensitizing could be as much as taking a horse on and off a trailer a hundred times until they're quiet about it, you know? Mm -hmm nothing wrong with that as long as you got all day you know? right yeah, <laughs> and, right you know but some people consider flooding like really getting the horse in shutdown and everybody knows that a horse in shutdown is not learning so it, you want them learning so yeah you want that's, them that's where um getting assistance from an in-person trainer or taking advantage of something like the the university's videos where you could visually yes. because you have to understand you what a horse that's shut down quote looks like looks he has like. a they have a kind of a body language don't they the horse that is in shutdown 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, dull eyes, ears flop. I mean, they're, if you've done that or if somebody's done this to a horse that you've now, you know, taken on, then you have to recognize that and and build that trust. You have to build that bond. Uh, and there's really no way to do it but time and effort and go on those. The lessons on the Equus Online University that apply to that would be join ups for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, I'm talking everything from a green horse that you've never you know, it's come out of the field to a horse that's been, you know, through some rough owners maybe in their life or rough circumstances, you know, neglect or whatever, you're going to have to build up that trust. And sometimes they only get to a certain point, but it's doable. It, they will, they really do want to be with us if, uh, if, if we'll let them, you know, and we do set the conditions and the environment. So the the long and short of that is if you find your horse, giving you indicators that he is shutting down or is going towards that, that yeah. that's something that you have created. You need to back off. You need to reevaluate how you're approaching it and yeah. uh, keep that from happening because it's not a good state of, it's not a state of learning. It's not a good place for your horse to be. Right. I'll finish with this, that if you, um, you can end on a good note, just do whatever you can to end on a good note and then call it a day and, uh, you know, and start again tomorrow. That'll be fine. So just, just build on that trust. There we go. Very good. And we could talk on this all day long. So I should make Mm -hmm. a mental note to next time we get together to talk a little bit more about horses in shutdown, because I think there's a whole lot more horses out there that are in shutdown than people realize. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Because they, they struggle with the horses not learning. He's not progressing. Mm -hmm. Um, And their shutdown has a lot of faces. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do some notes on that. We'll do that again. All right. I think, I think uh, we should hear from our title sponsor, Omega Fields, and then we'll chat with our guest. Your horse is your partner in sport, in leisure, and just in life. To keep him at his peak performance and optimal health, a solid nutritional foundation is key. Ideally, horses are able to graze fresh, growing grasses, which most closely mimic their natural diet. But that may not always be possible, and we may need to supply some of those missing ingredients in today's diets and provide more functional foods. One component of a horse's diet that is often underfed are omega-3 fatty acids. While more prevalent in fresh forages, harvested forages are lower in omega-3 fatty acids due to their more advanced maturity. Obviously, grasses and legumes have to grow to a sufficient height in order to be harvested, while foraging patterns of horses show great preference for shorter, less mature plants. That's why modern horsemen and horsewomen trust Omega Horse Shine to provide a powerful, bountiful source of omega-3 fatty acids for their equine partners. Look for Omega Horse Shine from Omega Fields at your local tack and feed supplier, or you can find them online at omegafields.com. Jackie Catch Case grew up in Los Angeles. Her parents let her adopt her first pony when she was only six. Maple was a rescue horse that was blind in one eye and used to take off with her all the time because that missing sight made her spooky. It was no going back from there. Jackie was hooked. She counts on her greatest achievement in horsemanship as making the connection with horses. Um, It should be the way that one tries to approach people. She says, too, with patience, without assumptions, in a straightforward manner with clear communication. I love that about Jackie. She now works on a 37,000-acre farm in the majestic Montana landscape near Missoula. Gosh, for heaven's sake. You could ride for a week and still have places to explore on your next trip. I'm fortunate enough to be here at the resort at Paws Up. And I'm talking to Monty Roberts today, this morning, and a crackling fire you'll hear in the background, and Jackie Catchcase, who is the horse manager at the resort at Paws Up. So it's a privilege to meet you two here in this beautiful home. We're staying at the William Clark uh, Timber Home. And if people look up the resort at Paws Up, they'll see it is one of the most fantastic. You can't call it a hotel room. You can't even call it a hotel resort room. It is a beautiful log home and um, in a beautiful setting. So good morning. I know why you're here in Missoula, Montana, Monty. You're here to get an award, I think. Yeah, I think they're shooting at me from somewhere, yeah, but <laughs> and that's and a, a wonderful fire. 
We've had a rain through the night, which will get the grass green. They're going to get snow soon, I bet you, because it's about 41 or two. And um, we're staying at a place that is indescribable. I, 29 years now, I'm traveling the world. And I stay in hotels more times than I stay at home. And um, thanks to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of England, I, I get an influential part of all of this, which allows me to stay in five-star hotels a lot of times. I'm not particularly fond of five-star hotels. And um, it's a difficult thing for a cowboy to learn how to do, travel the world and stay in these hotels. But I tell you, pause up just changes everything, and they're off the charts. The resort at Paws Up, outside of um, Missoula, Missoula, Montana. Yeah. The name of the town right here is... We're, right we're in Greeno, Montana. Greeno, yeah. Montana. Yeah, right down the road from Donner. Oh, yeah, that's right. I've been to Donner, Montana. Uh, used to do some practice roping in Donner, Montana. Some guy had a roping arena there, and, <clears throat> and I... Rodeoed in Missoula quite a, quite a bit, and I did a um, a night of demonstrations in Missoula, Montana, about I don't know, fifteen years ago okay. or so. But it's an incredible area. But this pause up thing, I mean, it's unbelievable. We're staying in a house that could have twenty people in it, yep. and it's off up in the woods and. Just absolutely unbelievable in terms of they thought of everything, and. Uh, if ever I wanted to promote somebody's product, it's Paws Up, That's the nice. resort at Paws Up yeah. um, in, in Montana. I'm sure it's on the Internet and you can find it. But we're here with a young lady that's the um, chairman of, the director of horses and all things horses here at Paws Up. And... I am absolutely astonished at how a young lady could be born in Los Angeles, right? grow up in San Fernando Valley, right. and uh, move to Montana with this kind of position. And then I've just heard her bio a little bit about her, and uh, she has a command of the English language, and she answers the questions so close to what I would like a person to answer the question. It's, uh, it's just absolutely unreasonable mm. to think that we got lucky enough to come to a place like this and meet a person like Fine, that. Jackie. Yeah, Jackie. So you say you're first generation from Hungary, mm -hmm. though, first generation here in the U.S. But you, you sound like a valley girl. Oh, I'm totally a valley girl, <laughs> born and raised. Uh, yep, my parents immigrated here, uh, gosh, 35 years ago, something like that, um, and had plans for what my American dream should be. Little did they know that that included uh, living on a ranch in Montana and uh, riding horses, working with horses every day. Um, but there's still a part of me I, that that holds on to that valley girl upbringing here and there. Uh, can't fully let it go. Yeah, I did hear that totally in totally. there. Totally in there. <laughs> well, um, I, I heard that your your first pony you had was in the San Fernando Valley. That's right. Yeah, a little living? rescue. Yep, Maple. She was a little rescue horse, blind in one eye. Um, right outside in Chatsworth, there was a a horse and pony rescue, and you could adopt a horse and uh, take English riding lessons. So I adopted Maple, and very regularly she would take off bucking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and run out of the arena and into her stall. And, oh, boy, did you learn to stay on a horse with a horse like that. Yeah, isn't that true? Yeah. I don't know why we start kids on ponies first because, if you know, they're in or out with the pony, right? I say the same thing. We here at the resort at Paws Up, we, most of our kids' horses are half draft. They're tall. They're leggy. And you walk these horses up to parents and they, they say, my God, that's what you're going to put my tiny six-year-old on? You don't have anything smaller? And I always look at them and say, you don't want smaller. <laughs> Small pony. Pony, big attitude. 
That's the truth. That's yeah. the truth. Well, in reading your bio and reading a little bit about you, I just felt that there was a lot of um, symmetry between what you do. Even though I'm looking at a very young gal, your parents may have moved here 35 years ago, but you're nowhere near 35, are you? Oh, you're kind. 30, oh. 31. 31. But she looks young. It must be the horses. Mm-hmm. And um, we're looking at an 82-year-old iconic, well, you're getting the Equestrian Icon Award here at the Equus International Film Festival. So you are an icon, Monty and Dad. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) But you have so many similar philosophies, and I'd love for you to share a little bit of those. Get me out of the conversation, and you two just talk horses. You know, I make a joke of it, but it is wonderful. And um, anybody that can finish up uh, this mission we're on, uh, feeling like they made a change, they made a difference, that they improved things. Um, somebody ought to give you an icon award because that encourages the next generation to come on with their dreams. And, um, boy, it's so important not to hold down the next generation and cause them to sit on their dreams, but go for them and put those uh, goals out there. And no matter how difficult they seem or impossible they might seem to you, I I think I have proven that there's no dreams too big and there's just nothing impossible. Um, I often say to Her Majesty when we're visiting, because she she discovered me and uh, endorsed me, and sent me to the world and said, you can't stop. You've got to keep going. More people have to know about this, con- these concepts of yours. And um, if I had stopped at the time that she discovered me, I wanted to go fishing, dry fly fishing. Yeah. Um, if I had stopped then and said, what would your dreams have been that you could do I couldn't have made my dreams as high as what they have been. I I have reached higher goals than I ever could have made for myself. It's just not reasonable to achieve the kind of goals that I have. And hopefully it's not stopped, you know. Um, There's some things coming up quite uh, close in the future that um, increase those dreams and, and... elevate those goals. So uh, I say that to Jackie and and to everybody that's 31 mm-hmm. or 21 mm-hmm. or 12, right. you know, keep those goals going. You know the story of my high school teacher that said that my paper that I wrote was not reasonable because it was asking for too much. And um, that was too have a farm like I have Mm -hmm. and I have it. And he came back with his church group and said, don't sit on the dreams of the next generation. They can do it if they keep trying. So, uh, it's quite a, a gift to me to come to this place and to meet Jackie and, um, and to receive this award that I wasn't supposed to know. I think that I was getting, but they had to tell me why I was coming here for some reason. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Jackie, what did, what did you think when you were 12 about what you might do? Um, I, on it, I never fathomed that working with horses growing up in Los Angeles, you just, you don't, that's not a, a way of life that seems sustainable mentally and, uh, monetarily. Um, you know, my parents came here and their American dream for me was to be a doctor or a lawyer. And, you know, I wanted to be a teacher. And when I told them that, oh boy, you should have heard the fight that ensued because I was, I wasn't reaching high enough, uh, in their mind. And, but I just never imagined that there could be a life where you can live simply and work with something that, that brings you peace and that you can constantly be making a difference for it and for you. Um, so <laughs> certainly I did not dream this. Yeah. No, you wouldn't have dreamed this, but 
What is the dream for the next phase of your life? Where would you like to go? You know, this is, as long as I've been in this industry, I've been in the, the guest ranch hospitality industry for 10 years and working with horses. Um, I've, I'm still, to be honest, feeling it out. I'm in such an amazing place now, uh, working here as the horse manager, um, getting to make a difference with troubled horses, older troubled horses, and introducing people to horses, people that may never have seen a horse or um, might not be comfortable near an animal quite that large. Um, so getting to bring horses to people and getting to work with troubled horses right now seems like just the right thing. Maybe in the future, bringing, bringing a training component, a personal training component for, for outside folks that aren't guests, bringing their horses in perhaps uh, would be the next goal. But to be honest, reaching out and, and dreaming big at this point is, it doesn't sound funny to say that it's a little bit new to me. <laughs> well, it might be new to you, but what you've already done proves that you have that ability to go up the ladder mm -hmm. and just keep thinking about the next step. And uh, it, it may be right here, uh, but there's steps that can be taken. Mm -hmm. I think you're kind of dreaming that way, mm -hmm. um, whereby you become a different person than you are now with different responsibilities and higher goals. And um, I'm sure you would tell the next generation to do the same thing because uh, you've enjoyed this uplift of uh, goal setting. And um, your parents from Hungary, uh, of course they wanted you to be something very special. Um, I spend a bit of time in Hungary and I have three or four instructors in, in hum Hungary, so I'm, I'm asked to go back. One of my largest audiences ever was in Budapest um, with about 7,000 Wow. people in the in the auditorium and um it went well and we have people tumbling over themselves in hungary trying to get something going for themselves because politically they've been so oppressed and they're the crossroads of evil doers really uh people that want to take over other people's property cross through hungary mm -hmm. uh, with regularity but you have some absolutely unbelievable people from Hungary. Laos Kashai, for instance, is um, the world's leading horseback archer. Oh, wow. And um, Laos is just a hero of mine because he dreamed big. And for 20 years now, he's been in 8 to 10 major contests per year and has never been beaten once. He's, he's just another dimension in horseback archery following uh, Attila the Hun. Yeah. And, um, and then we have some good instructors there that are thinking big on, in the horse world. And uh, I've, I've been to some of the oldest stables on earth uh, right there in Hungary. And those people really need to dream bigger and really need to shed some of the historical shortcomings that their country has provided for them. If only the American people could go and see how lucky they are to be here in America, there'd be fewer of these marches in the streets and people angry about silly little things that one another do or perceive. Um, we are absolutely blessed to be in this United States of America and uh, you you really owe it to your parents for taking the effort to break out of there and oh boy do I <laughs> yeah what did your father do uh, my father was working at a bank in Hungary he now is a network engineer for uh, Northrop Grumman uh, in the aerospace engine um, the aerospace field wow so he's a brilliant guy He's incredibly smart, and he's super supportive. He wanted to grow up to be a teacher, so the fight was less huge when I told him originally. Um, but, you know, he, he now understands and kind of embraces that this is the kind of happiest I've ever been. So, 
in his mind, I've achieved an American dream. Yeah. Wonderful. What do you think you impart to horses best? What is it about you and your working with horses that you think is probably your greatest talent? Oh boy. <laughs> Talking about myself. Yep. Um, I am willing to take a step back if something's not working. And I, I try to always first question inwardly. What am I doing wrong? How am I miscommunicating? If whatever it is I'm asking isn't maybe being produced or caught onto by the horse. Um, and then saying, well, maybe that step is too big. Maybe we need to break it down even further. And there's some other fundamental building block that's missing. And, um, so patience, I guess, in that respect. Patience, yeah. Um, I think dad often says it's good to have a plan. It's really bad to fall in love with it. You know? uh-huh. it oh, I like, like that. Yeah. 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 And wouldn't I love answering that question just as she just did? Because, um, the man who listens to horses, uh, it means a lot to me that we do take a step back. And how many times have you heard me say, if you want to see what is really troubling your horse, look in the mirror. Yeah. And right. so she said, look inwardly yeah. and see what you're doing. And how many times have you ever said, have, have you ever heard me say, keep it incremental, it. small steps. The horse can learn well. But keep it incremental. Yeah. And then if you go at something like you have 15 minutes to do it, it probably takes you all day. But if you go at it like you have all day, you might get it done in 15 minutes. Because they want you to wait, take a breath, step back, be introspective. And uh, Jackie has, you can see that those, those are my answers and yeah. they so parallel, yeah. parallel what you just said. It's just incredible. Yeah, a good horseman does. I, I honestly think that's one of the best things you do is to break steps down into incremental. But it's also timing, isn't it? Um, you know, it's got to be the right steps, too. It's got to be really reading the horse and knowing that you're being fair. And I think that's what you meant by maybe you're biting off too much in one step and oh. you get incremental. But, yep, but you absolutely. recognize that, that he was, that horse was maybe shutting down or not understanding. Absolutely. And I think... And I'm very new to this. You have so much experience. So in my mind, and you can certainly tell me if I'm misguided in this idea, but the difference between working with that 20 year old horse that's troubled, that has been, has skipped foundational steps and gone to work and kind of survived, uh, versus the, uh, you know, the brand new cult, the wide eyed, uh, blank canvas. I like what you said earlier about you know, you're dealing with a lot of novices, a lot of people maybe never ridden a horse before. Mm -hmm. And you, (laughs) yeah, you put them on a 20 year old horse and they're not fair to them. And so this 20 year old is sort of glazed over at this point, right? His job is, is nothing more than a job. No, ma'am. No, no, ma'am. Uh, we bring our horses in every spring off of winter pasture, uh, and they all get put into the round pen. We work on join up, hooking on, um, and then they go right back to groundwork. So can you walk that circle in a nice balanced way around us where you're reaching equally with all four quarters? Are you, do you know how to roll that hind end over? Are you sitting back to be able to come across on your front? Can you tolerate a flag, a tarp, a spray bottle, a rope around your feet? Um, we're putting every single one of these horses every year through the ringer because they do. A lot of them sit all winter just getting fat and happy and, um, they forget they become horses again. And I do think that that's the beauty of our program is that our horses get to be horses. They don't get put into stalls and pampered and kind of forget their essence. But that does mean that <laughs> every spring, you know, we've got our work cut out for us, but we expect these horses and encourage our riders to steer them independently. They, we'd, we'd ask them whenever possible, get out of line, make your horse focus on you. Don't let them focus on the butt or the trail in front of them. Uh, Weave around the trees. Uh, if you'd like to trot, let's learn to trot, but let's do it properly. Um, we talk about tap, tap, tap until you get movement and then release, quit it, give your horse the thank you. So 
they may be novice riders. These horses certainly know their job. Most of them, you know, knock on wood, are bomb proof. Um, and we tell them that. Um, that doesn't stop us from teaching them what a one rain stop is because you never know. Uh, but no, I would say, I would say that most of these horses really enjoy their work. They know what their job is, but they will, they'll try and figure you out and think about you as the rider and then essentially work with you. Excellent. That's, yeah. that's a good program. Yeah. That's a well-run program. It's, um, considerably more than most programs do. Mm-hmm. As you know, um, most people go to a program and they get on a, an older horse mm-hmm. that just goes down the trail and, and isn't very responsive. The really. nose to tail trail. Mm-hmm. When, right? when the little things go wrong, they, they are not um, quite as cooperative mm-hmm. as the horses that it sounds like Jackie puts through this little program. Quite unusual, really. Quite a big program. Almost 50 horses you're in charge of? Yeah, 50 horses, not counting um, our owner's personal horses are in the program itself. Yeah. And we do have a wide range of ages. We do have our older kids' horses, of course, that, I mean, we need to erect statues to these horses (laughs) because they're incredible. But even, um, I'm on a 20-year-old horse right now that has more forward life than I have ever, I've never been so fast on a horse. This horse has so many problems, so he's going to be my project for a little bit. But um, even some of our older kind of tried and true horses that know the program, golly, do they have some get up and go and some, you know, so that so that an experienced rider, we've had several um, level two, level three, level four dressage riders, hunter jumpers that come in, equestrians that want to come ride, um, that just rave about these these yeah. nice, lively horses, too, and these responsive horses that we have. Nice. Have you had some uh, celebrities here? Have you had some important people, people important to you? Um, we have had, yes, but we can't talk about them, but we do, yes, we do get okay, the don't celebrities. Name no We're names. Trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yep, the celebrities like to come here. It's a... Um, it's kind of a, a safe haven for them, right? They nice. can keep their anonymity if they want to. They can kind of get away from it. Um, everyone's absolutely incredible. We get to know them, and they become essentially part of our little family here. And um, you never know that they were somewhat ultra famous when they're here in backwoods of Montana in this amazing yeah. setting. Well, you got them on a horse, so that does right? kind of put it in neutral and it territory. Changes, and it changes them, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's neutral territory. Now, all of a sudden, it's relying on somebody else to kind of guide them through. Right. Yeah. Right. I love that. I, and it, it probably is really good for their head too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Horses are always good for their head anyway. Everybody said, yeah. Yeah. Everybody said too. You see what this made me think about is that uh, there's a lot of people walking around that call me a celebrity mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not a celebrity. One of the proofs of that is you can tell anybody I was here you can use my name all you want because this is a great place and uh, everybody ought to experience it. I understand the need for uh, privacy in the, on the part of these real celebrities, which I am not. You're not I'm Johnny a, Depp. I am, a, <laughs> I am a cowboy. You are a celebrity in your own world, sir. Don't I'm a cowboy short. from California, and I want to remain that way. I was speaking with a scientist the other day, and... I have two doctorates in behavioral sciences, so I can go into that litany whereby you talk about behavioral sciences and all of the uh, sort of Latin words and stuff. And she said, please, Mr. Roberts, don't lose that colloquial information that you've gotten. You have the best professors in the world, the horses, and I won't lose it. I just won't. Uh, I will be a cowboy when they put me in a box. Yeah. Well, what I love about horses is when you say, like when you're doing your ticketed demonstrations, public demonstrations, mm-hmm. is when you walk in that round pin, that horse doesn't know you're Monty Roberts. No, <laughs> no. no, no. <laughs> you have he, to do your job. He yeah. hasn't read my books. That's or right. my videos. And I think that's what people love about horses is they know they're honest. They can't lie. Oh, that is the biggest thing I tell people that I enjoy so much about horses. Horse doesn't lie. And you can, you can get all manner of people working with them or guests that say that they have experience or say they want to do X, Y, and Z, but that horse tells you really quick, um, kind of where somebody is and where you are day to day. I can tell when I walk out and work with the horse, if working five, 10 minutes with them, if my, my head's not in the right place, that horse is letting me know and, and again, taking that step back. And taking yeah. that step back. Yeah. Yep, you're a mirror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, thank you both. I appreciate your time this morning, and let's get outside. It's Saturday morning in Missoula, Montana, or outside of it. We've got a fire built, but let's uh, let's go We're see some horses. Go see Shy Boy. Y- yes, Shy Boy. The, the movie is getting an award today, and also there's a Monty Roberts special retrospective they're doing of films and some of your talk. So okay. yeah, so let's get cool. do that. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, guys. Thank That's you, Monty. Thank you. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges, and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths, waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Michael Wakefield resides in Klamath Falls, Oregon, where he teaches driving, ridden dressage, and trains driving horses, too. But you can see him in parades throughout Wyoming, Montana, Washington, Idaho, California, and Oregon. He's a Carriage Association of America master driver. Michael grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota, entirely powered by horses. He learned at an early age to cut, rake, and pull loose hay up for the for the winter. And at four, he was driving, driving in quotes, a team for on the wagon and the hay loader. Well, he thought he was driving. The team pretty much knew their job and responded to his father's voice commands. The family had 12 head of draft horses of different sizes for the many different jobs that had to be done. They had a large 17 hand shire for the plow and disc, and they had smaller Belgiums for the mower and hay rake and a smart leggy team of Percherons to haul the grain wagon to town. There was corn and soybeans to be planted, cultivated and har- harvested, all requiring different numbers of horses in the hitch. By age nine, Michael could harness and hitch a team of five to the grain binder. That's amazing. Michael became interested in buggies and carriage driving in the 1970s and has since been studying and honing his craft, competing, teaching, training, and breeding driving horses. He is a fourth-generation horseman and competes in combined driving events up and down the West Coast and in Canada. For the past 15 years, Michael has driven a four-in-hand on the stagecoach for the Wells Fargo Bank. Well, welcome, Michael Wakefield. We're honored to have you on the show. How are you? And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, our pleasure. I, I've listened to many interviews that you've given, and I've seen some of the the work that you've done. And it, it's our honor. I, I have to say, you have a storied career that is uh, continuing today, and you just get better. And I think every time I call you, I catch you out with the horses, pretty much. So, what are you working on this morning? Well, this morning we launched our website finally. <laughs> oh, oh, technology! Listen I've been to that. spending lots of time <laughs> fine tuning. Very good, very good. But we Not have out with five the horse. horses. Oh. Yeah, we have five horses in training here right now, so that pretty much takes up my day. I'm sure. I am sure. Well, if a listener has never experienced driving, what would you say is the reason they should try it? Tell us about driving. Well. Uh, driving offers a lot of things that riding won't. If you if you have a family, for instance, and you can only afford one horse, well, one person can ride at a time. But what about training the horse to drive? The whole family can go. It's true. Oh, now we've opened up a whole new world, haven't we? Guests <laughs> come over, we can take them for a ride on our horse. <laughs> yeah. And, and then later in life, when uh, some of us 
get a little stiff, <laughs> get a few <laughs> bones out of whack, <laughs> and riding has lost its appeal. Carrie's driving yeah. still works for most of us. That's true. That's so there's true. two avenues to explore. Those are really good ones. Those are really good ones. So I think I hear you saying, too, that a horse isn't just a carriage horse or just a riding horse. That's right. Most horses can be multi-purpose, uh, as long as the horse isn't what we call reactionary. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you a question about yeah some of that, too. But um, I, I thought I'd start with maybe the different types of horses that are used to pull. I mean, there's such a variety of horses, really, and such a variety of vehicles. So I don't know if it's a tough question or not to answer, but what are the temperaments that you like to see in a horse that, that you enjoy training? Well, I do a little test. Okay. I take a milk jug and I stick six or seven little pebbles in it. And okay. I go to either a round pen or an enclosed area. And I aggressively chase the horse a little bit with my shaking <laughs> can. Oh, it's a can. It's and, a can with rocks. Yeah, in it. I shake it a little bit. Yeah. Wow, that's loud. And then the horse usually will move away from me. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just stand their ground. But if they move away, I gently, gently relax the amount of force that I'm using. And a driving horse candidate will come over to me when I'm done and explore it. Mm. He will sometimes even put his nose on it. Mm -hmm. And in rare cases, like a stallion I'm training right now, he'll come over and take the jug out of my hand and shake it at me. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Some of your own medicine. <laughs> but uh, a horse that will, uh, will come back to you and explore what that was, I think that's key. Mm. Uh, I, I've never had a horse that would do that that wasn't a really good driving candidate. So they're curious and they're intelligent uh, and and, and not right. totally fearful by nature. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's nice. That's a good description for a good horse, actually. I, I like that, too. Yeah. So I know that you do uh, a lot of ground training first. I mean, I get probably everybody in, um, who drives does. But are, are there... Are there certain things like walking over plastic or other crazy things that you do, like the rocks and again, that help de-spook a horse like that, uh, where, he's, where he puts his feet? Well, the main problem is getting them used to having shafts at their sides mm -hmm. if you're driving single or a mm -hmm. pole between he and his partner. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of groundwork um, making the horse move from side to side, give his haunches, give his hips. Um, move his shoulder over, things like that. It gets to the point where I can just look at a foot and he will move it for me. Mm -hmm. And then when we go to the blinker bridle, of course, we have to translate that all into English. So then the verbal commands that you establish during the ground training become his only signal. You can touch the whip to his side and encourage it once you're mounted or in the buggy. But uh, other than that, the horse has to respond quite a bit on verbal, a lot more verbal than you would ever think of um, riding, where mm -hmm. we cluck and kiss, perhaps, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all kinds of signals for turning and easing down the pace and speeding up, all mm -hmm. kinds of cues, keep the horse relaxed and know what's, what's ahead of him. Mm -hmm. And and that gets to be pretty advanced stuff. Like when you pull the Wells Fargo back wagons and the, there are so many, uh, and I assume that people will assume that you put the horses in the same spots each time. The team knows the team. And um, so some will be closer to you and some will be further away. So cues between the horse so that the horses know who you're talking to. How do you do that? Well, the horse has always got his name first in the command series. Ah, okay. So if I'm in a single buggy and I want my horse to move forward, I call his name. I say, Mr. Mm -hmm. Peanut, walk on. <laughs> so there's three elements. I called his attention that it was him I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. I told him what I wanted him to do. And then I told him to move off and do it. Got he's it. relaxed. He knows. And he's, yeah, yeah, and he's listening. Mm -hmm. And so then if mm -hmm. I have a four-up hitch going, and I have a laggard, a slow starter, guess mm. whose name I call first? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so I say, Lucy, 
team, move on. <laughs> so Lucy's already leaned up into the collar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the rest exactly. of the team catches up. <laughs> yeah, and, and all the rest of the team knows that Lucy's probably the lagger too. So they're they're happy to have you call <laughs> her out right. first. Sure. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> yeah, they love it too. I love how you talk to your horses too. But one of the things that I thought you said was really important is that there's not a lot of chattering. There's not a lot of jabber. So everything you say up there is very pur- purposeful, right? P- pretty much. The horses know when I'm talking to them. Uh, once in a while, I have to have a conversation with a passenger, but the horses, they'll put their ears back, and when they see it doesn't pertain to them, they point their ears back forward again and go on about their business. Oh, that's so interesting. Do you ever, do you have any? There's a certain, I think there's a certain tone you use mm. with them when you're speaking to them. They, they pick up on it immediately. Mm-hmm. Have you blown that one before? Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes the dog gets out of control. And I'll talk oh. to the dog, and the horses all respond. <laughs> <laughs> that could be bad. I mean, a fetch. No. <laughs> well, so what? What do you think is more critical to the communication when you're driving the voice cues or the rain cues? You're saying voice cues, yeah? Yes. Um, you know, just like in upper level dressage riding, your body is telling the horse to do certain things and the bit is only sustaining it Mm -hmm. and that's very true the reins are secondary to the voice commands Mm -hmm. so So much of school them in yeah (laughs) that yes i can see why the consistency and even the tone you know is important and how you get to know a team so well yeah right yeah and and writing so much of what we do when we ride is communicated through our our seat and our legs and and uh, shifting body weight, but you don't have any of that when you're driving. So no, what's... it's all taken away. So now we have to rely on our voice and the whip. Mm-hmm. And the whip, we don't use the whip as a weapon. The whip the whip is a leg substitute. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> in my teaching, I teach how to to just flick the lash down onto the barrel of the horse mm-hmm. to cause it to bend. For instance, if I'm turning right, I flick, flick the whip down onto the right side barrel, and mm-hmm. they move the barrel sideways, and now they're shaped in the mm-hmm. arc of the curve that we want to, to execute, uh, just like you would do with your seat bone and your leg. Gotcha, um, yeah. And they know the difference between the lash, which just floats down and touches them, mm-hmm. as opposed to one which tells them that they're being disciplined and they need to speed up or do whatever you said and they weren't paying attention, which mm-hmm. is a little sharper rap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I watch you, though, carefully, and a lot of your work is done with the reins, I think, too, just a little yeehaw. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so once light you, dressage, uh, once too. You start, yeah, once you start the turn, you have an active rein and an inactive rein, <laughs> just mm-hmm. like riding. Mm-hmm. The yeah. problem is that your horse is the nearest horse is 12 feet away. So you right. have a lot of rain between you and yeah. the horse. So the feel is entirely different than it is when you're riding. Sure. Sure. So recently you, uh, you joined Monty Roberts dad on his Equus online university and you created some lessons for the yeah, introduction. I was very honored to, to do so. Oh, we were honored to have you. Um, to, you know, we went straight to the top. <laughs> You're going to go get somebody who's going to be <laughs> foundational for something that he wants to put on his. This is, you know, his legacy piece is putting up these lessons. So tell us about that collaboration. What, what were the goals? Well, um, the goal was just to show Monty um, my training method and how it fits in with his aspirations for his well-rounded horse and I was very 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 impressed with the fact that the first horse he brought out was one that's in his program and it did everything (laughs) it did everything I asked it to do willingly so you know all the preparation and groundwork and the philosophy of handling the horse all of it jibed with everything that I think and know to be true Oh, that's nice. So it was it was a very successful venture, and I hope we can make a few more lessons mm-hmm. and progress that system yeah. a little further. 
I, I do too. I, I think, well, he insisted sort of as you listen to those lessons where there are three up there, he insisted at the end that we, you know, carry on because he, he likes to have all his willing partners horses trained to drive as well as ride um, because he thinks it demonstrates a high level of gentle, you know, he says it's a high level of mm-hmm. gentle. So, um, and his willing partners horses are ones that are meant for, you know, no yeehaw, no rodeo. These horses are can go to the trail. They've got a lot of energy, but they also uh, don't want to be any trouble. So he's really particular exactly. about those. But I love the fact that he did that um, extra training on them to drive, even if somebody doesn't intend to buy them and, and drive them. But do driving horses tend to be less spooky by virtue of their training or – just virtue of I the can, the rocks in, in the can. general, yes. In general, yes. We because we uh, institute the blinker bridle, and I, I want to explain that a little bit because I think okay. uh, it's misunderstood by a lot of people. Most people think that it's to focus the horse, and that's a secondary thing. Okay. The the blinker bridle is on the horse so that if something should spook the horse while he's hitched, he doesn't immediately transfer the spook to the buggy following him mm-hmm. because that's what happens. Um, they don't know what spooked them sometimes, but they get into flight mode and then anything will continue it. Mm-hmm. So the blinker keeps the horse from seeing the vehicle. So now if a balloon blows across the street and makes him a little wary and he jumps, he doesn't see the buggy jump behind him. <laughs> yeah, so here we are. We have solved a problem solved by yes. the Scythians 2,500 years before Christ. Is that the time <laughs> that they invented blinkers? That's they unearthed blinkers from that time period. No kidding. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you. Have you ever been able to go over to Europe and drive? Have you? Uh, yes. I yeah. studied in Europe in, uh, under John uh-huh. Parker at Swingle Tree Farm. Um, John Parker wrote the syllabus for uh, Carriage Association of America's Driver Evaluation Program. Mm-hmm. So he is the grand master, I guess you would say. Wonderful. <laughs> and a wonderful character. And, and you, a you're teacher. able, a great teacher. And um, and this was what country is he in? He's in England. He's in a little He's town in... called Wingfield, mm-hmm. which is near Dis, which is right on the Suffolk Norfolk border. That must have been such a wonderful experience. About an hour experience. and a half north of London, yeah. Yeah. Well, everything's an hour and a half north of London. No, I'm kidding. It's <laughs> sort of it's the big ring road. Seems so, it? doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it, it, that's where you want to stay, too. Not any closer than an hour and a half from London, if you can help it. But, uh, so do you have to have special licenses to go out on the roads in England? There? Well, that's a that's a strange thing to ask. Um, in, in England, you have to have a license to compete in other words, you have to show competency before you're ever allowed to go to a, an event where right. there are other horses and carriages. Mm-hmm. In Germany, you have to have a license to go upon the streets. You can't go on a public roadway. Okay. And it's like, uh, I don't know if you know what a boater's card is here in this country. A but voter's if you operate card? a boat in the United oh, States, you have to okay. carry a boater's card, which means that okay. you understand where the buoys are and, and what, what the rules are. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, all the rules of boating. Right. And it's not a license. But if you get caught without one, oh, it's well. the same thing. You're going to get fined and reprimanded. So so in Germany and England, it's already come to pass that there is a level of training that's expected, a competency, I would say, before you go on a public street or before you go to a meet where there's other horses you might put in danger. Really good idea. So I, I think... I think it's coming in this country and coming very soon. That's why I really embraced the program when I heard about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I went up through all the levels, all the way, level one, two, three, and master driver mm-hmm. to be ready myself to help this. Because if there's one thing about driving that that uh, directs me, it's safety. Yeah. Safety, safety, safety. Because everywhere I go with the Wells Fargo team, I see hitches in parades. Sometimes they've come to the parade the first time they've driven. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They're yeah. braver than oh, yeah. I can be. <laughs> we see it all. <laughs> and yeah, hitches I was, that I was, are just I was preposterously anybody... put together. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have less, had less. Yeah, you know, education is cheap. 
We right. just have to avail ourselves of it. A lot cheaper than the hospital, for sure. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, I never worry about doing things for myself. I always worry about, you know, the people driving next to me anyway. So I'm always for all those it's rules. I don't care. Way. I'll go get the rules, you know. It, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> encouraging others to do, it, it's never a bad thing. I, you know, anybody who's taught their kids to drive knows, <laughs> you know, common <laughs> sense ain't so common. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the day, you know, in the day uh, when buggies were the scene, everybody had ridden one. Most people had driven one. Mm-hmm. Almost everybody had ridden a horse, and people were around horses on a daily basis. But yeah. we we can't expect that level of familiarity now. Uh, mm-hmm. Good heavens, how many how many what percent of the population are horse owners? Right, very exactly. few. Very few anymore. And so and it's we have people leisure. walking out in the street in, in front of a buggy because they don't, they don't oh. get it. <laughs> I've heard stories and, and with their children or something, small children. Yeah. And, so yeah. The, yeah. all all carriage drivers have to be defensive drivers. We can't yes. have any aggression or stupidity. Or stupidity, which is, that's the tough part. So I heard a, um, a lore, and I don't know if it's true, uh, that Central Park in New York, the Central Park that was um, created there to, in order to keep uh, a, a green belt and a, and a place to go in the middle of the city, was really created for carriages for the bit of it, the aristocracy or the people who could afford it in the middle of the town. Is that true? Do you know? Well, for the most part, it is. Um, in the early 1900s, it's a tandem club that met there. Now, tandem driving is one of the most risky of all the drivings because you have two horses in straight line, one ahead of the other. Yeah. Well, the lead horse, should he decide to be a fool, could mm-hmm. get you in a bundle of trouble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he can turn around, come back, and look at you. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so... In order to join the tandem club in New York City, you had to be schooled in the manly arts. What that meant was <laughs> driving tandem may come to fisticuffs, <laughs> and you oh, better be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very gentlemanly. <laughs> so, so, so yes, much for uh, Thunder Park, <laughs> it, the park has a long history of carriages and carriage driving, and unfortunately, um, some people without any horse sense think that carriage driving is an abuse of the animal. Yeah. I hope that and goes quite on. frankly, my horses love their work. <laughs> they come to me willingly to put their bridles on. Yeah. So I don't know where that comes from. I can think it comes from lack of education and experience. So. Yeah. Ignorance. And, ignorance and, and so. bless their hearts. They, they, they have their heart in the right place. They don't want to see animal abuse and, but they don't recognize it when they do see it. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. my problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I was I was listening to just the back and forth between you and your horse, and some of the lessons that you gave too. And at one point, I wanted to ask you about this. At one point, watching your lesson, I heard you breathe. It was deeply, and and I heard it. It was audible. Was that for the horse, or was that for you? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you familiar with Sally Swift's work? Yes. Yes. Uh, riding, centered riding by Sally Swift. Riding. Yes. And that's one of the things she really stresses. If the horse doesn't know you're breathing, <laughs> horses hold their breath yeah. while they're listening intently to see if there's something wrong. And if yeah. they hear you doing it, they immediately pick up on it. <laughs> yeah. It's like telepathy. <laughs> Do it for us. So yes. give, me, give me one of your deep breaths that yeah. they can hear. Yeah, they want to hear some a big expel. <sighs> That's what yeah. they do when they're relaxed. It was almost, you had almost like a sing song and it was like, <sighs> like this that I heard. Yeah. Is that what you? Is that you? Yeah. I, I'm, you know, yeah, we're all learning here. So we want to hear what the master does. You know? Give me all the tips. <laughs> Very often I, I let out a big deep breath. I'll tell you, one of my earliest trainers was our landlord when I was on a farm in Minnesota. Uh, we farmed 410 acres with horsepower. Wow. But my landlord, could walk out into any field and catch any horse. And I, I never understood the magic of it until one day I heard him get downwind of the horse and expel a huge amount of breath. And the horse sensed it and walked up to sniff. 
That's a great tip. It, it, it's incredible. And I've tried it many times and it's worked. And it does work. And that's an intelligent horse too. That's wonderful. I have some rapid fired questions for you um, for newbies to driving and um, just, just two or three here. And so just off the top of your head. So newbies to driving, get around is left and come around is right when driving your horse. Is, is that universal? Yes. Okay. No, right. that's carriage driving. That's carriage driving. Okay. What else? Carriage is driving, and it comes from England. So you won't hear it in Germany, and you won't hear it, you know, in other parts of Europe. It's only English speaking. English, and English okay. influence. Get Makes and come. Sense. Get left, come right. Yes. Okay. And but that replaces a... the Western G and haw. <laughs> okay, that's. I was going to ask you about that. What's the yeah. G and haw? Okay. G to the right and haw to the left, and there's a lot of old folk songs. Um, where those words appear and, and everybody in the day, of course, understood what that meant. Um, there's a line in a Huddy Ledbetter song, Go back buck and gee by the lamb. <laughs> and I wouldn't have had any idea until you... He was so... talking to two horses. <laughs> so cute. He was telling the horse on the right to go back because the other horse going to go around him and they were going to gee to the right. Oh my gosh, I, I got to re-listen to all these old songs now just to know what they were talking about. So differentiate real quickly for us, carriage versus coach. Well, carriages are like the light vehicles and the coaches are more like the commercial vehicles with the exception of the, the park drag and the rooftop brake are very heavy private coaches. Okay. And in the day of uh, wealth in New York, Park drags were taken out with four-in-hand harness and horses, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like a Sunday show-off time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> much, like, much like in the countryside, coming home from church on Sunday afternoon, a lot of people drug race. Oh, is that right? <laughs> they would get next to their neighbors, and they'd put their horse against the other guy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it Men just never added change. to the excitement. <laughs> They Some didn't learn much in church that exactly. day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've got, do you have different language for the carriage versus coach too? Or is that all the same? No, uh, carriages and coaches are the same, but we teach agricultural hitches here too. So we use G and Haw. And if you're showing in a Western venue, G and Haw are more appropriate. Hmm. If you're showing on a buckboard or a Western vehicle of some kind. Okay. Uh, and certainly all hitch horses, like the Budweiser team, G and mm -hmm. Haw is appropriate. Ah, oh, so cool. I can't wait to see one at Wells Fargo in person. I've never seen that. So do you use whistles and clucks and kisses and, and other sounds too? I, I cluck and kiss, oh. yeah. Kiss, okay. All right. But and um, Like I told yeah. you, that I always say the horse's name because That's now right. I have his attention. And I tell him what it is I'm going to do, like walk on. And yeah. then I cluck to tell him when to walk mm -hmm. on. Right. And they wait. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They do. I love how you use the horse's name in the training tool. It, it, I just can tell. I didn't know that it was purposeful like that, but I could just tell that you seem to love your horses and, and love what you're doing. And it's contagious, Michael. I so appreciate you. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you for being on Horsemanship Radio. Whisper. Of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the herd. Episode 100. Dear Monty, do you still have Shy Boy? Where is he? I have read the Shy Boy book and seen both the films. It seems that you took Shy Boy home, but I wasn't clear. Did you release him again, or is he still a domesticated Mustang? I would be interested to know what he does for activity and how his health is. I can't remember his age, but since he's a bit of a hero for me, I would like to know more about his current status. Monty's answer. 
Shy Boy is at home and flags up farms in Solvang, California. As the second DVD indicates, he came back to us and we took him home. That second DVD was made in 1998, while the first was in 1997. I've taken Shy Boy back to the wilderness several times in the past eight years, and while we've had fun out there, it seems to me he has been quite happy to return home. The BLM records show that he was born in 1994 and captured in 1997 near Tonopah, Nevada. He is a wonderful little horse who loves people and especially children. Thank you for asking about him as it gives me a chance to let everyone know that he is happy and fine. Shy Boy is active in the training program here at Flag is Up. He often escorts young thoroughbreds to and from the racetrack and even assists in them learning about the starting gate and other procedures that tend to frighten the young race prospects. Occasionally, Shy Boy will be asked to assist the young Western cutting horses that are in training and seems to have a lot of fun with this activity. In the recent past, Shy Boy was even ridden by a young lady who was interested in dressage. While he will never be a competitive dressage horse, he did learn to move in a very attractive fashion under the dressage saddle and did not appear to be out of place even in this discipline, well removed from anything to which he was accustomed. Many of Shy Boy's fans will remember that he traveled extensively in the western part of the United States during the late 1990s and early 2000s. He was a presence at public television broadcasting studio while they aired his DVD as part of the PBS fundraiser. He was perfectly comfortable going into studios with lights, cameras, and many objects that would frighten an ordinary horse. Literally hundreds of millions of people, one million on site in the rest by TV, watched Shy Boy lead five other Mustangs down Colorado Boulevard in 2004 and 2005 Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena, California on New Year's Day. He was a role model for the other horses and a perfect mount for my wife, Pat, who led our Mustang contingency while riding this wonderful partner of ours. At age 23, Shy Boy looks terrific, and to observe him at home and flag is up, you would get the impression that he feels like he owns the place, and all the other horses residing here are simply meant to keep him company. Some nice people donated a special floor comfort stall for Shy Boy's doll. It is a cushy rubber mat, and with bedding over it, it's as though he's on a cloud. His days are spent either working or in an outsized paddock, and at night, he's on his cloud. On our front gate, it says, Visitors Welcome, and we mean it. You can come and see Shy Boy anytime you want. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. November 18th coming up, Monty Roberts Tour in Berlin. That's coming soon. And then November 19th, Monty is in Berlin again for a second show. It's it, Germans are crazy over there. They're going crazy for Monty. And then January 6th, put this in your calendar, 2018, West Coast Dressage Festival Masterclass Series. Uh, Roberts will be demonstrating his expertise and skill, first in Temecula, California at Galway Downs. And then there's an April 21 in Temecula, too. That'll be coming soon. Listen for that. So January 6th, April 21. And then for those long-term planners, July 23 through August Third, 2018, is the Gentling Wild Horses course at Flag is Up Farms in California. And then August 6th through 10, right after that, 2018, Monty's special training at Flag is Up as well. And for those of you who couldn't get that all into your memory banks as we went through it, because there's a lot there, you can find it all and more at MontyRoberts.com. Helpful, useful, and interesting website. Or you can go old school and give them a call on the phone. That's right. We'll have a lovely, wonderful, and informed person answer the phone if you dial 
805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com, where we will have pictures, links, and information about our guests today. And don't forget, we want to hear your feedback. You need to go to Facebook, and then you need to type in Monty Roberts, and then you need to click on Like the Page. And then write something about what you love about this podcast or people you want us to interview or topics you want us to talk about. It helps us make this show better. Or if you're a person who likes to be concise, you can follow Monty on Twitter. His handle on Twitter (laughs) is Monty underscore Roberts. And get the app. Don't miss any episodes. Just go to your app store, search Horse Radio Network and download it today. It's available for Android as well as iPhones. It's free and it's easy to use, or you can subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. That's right. Your favorite podcatcher. That's a good way to say it. And many thanks to our sponsors too. Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and Monty's Equus Online University. Thank you for helping sponsor them and and supporting us. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network too at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.